Perfect. Now, officially, welcome. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we are welcoming uh, the Wilder Bling Initiative today. And for those who are not familiar with the European Rewilding Network, uh, it is a network of currently 84 rewilding initiatives across the continent. And our objective is to bring these initiatives closer together and empower them with the information and the tools to be more successful in their rewilding endeavors. One of our products is these uh, rewilding intro webinars, which are public mini webinar series through which ERN initiatives can share their rewilding success stories um, in this public manner, and they can share, you know, showcase their work, their success, their achievements, their progress um, to the network members, but also to everyone in general. And this is not only available live like we are right now, but it's also going to be available on YouTube. Today, um, we will hear from two speakers. Uh, first, uh, there is Stan Smith, who is the Wilder Landscapes Manager at Kent Wildlife Trust, and also Vicky Brakel, who is the Conservation Officer at Wildwood Trust. And they're both part of the Wilder Bleen team. And the Wilder Bleen is an initiative that's implementing a pioneering and innovative strategy to restore keystone species and ecosystem engineers to this very large Asian woodland in the UK. Also, um, there's going to be one host, which is me, Julia Mata, and I am here as the European Rewilding Network Coordinator for Rewilding Europe. So today we have a very straightforward agenda and we're already almost done with the first part. And following that, we will have a presentation by both Stan and Vicky, where they will tell us about the Wilder Bean projects and its efforts in restoring keystone species. And later on, we will have a Q&A session. So for this Q&A session, um, because we're using the webinar space, you will have to use the Q&A function that is down below. So you can click that and then write down your questions. Feel free to start writing questions during the presentation itself. And at the end, I will bring up the questions um, and read them myself, myself to the speakers, Stan and Vicky, and they will answer them. There's also the possibility for you to upvote certain questions that you think are more relevant or that you really want answered. So thank you so much for being here. And I will now uh, let Stan and Vicky take over and talk, tell us all about the Wilder Bleen Initiative. Thanks very much, Julia. And uh, yeah, morning, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen so you can see our presentation. Hopefully that's working for everybody. Um, yes, and uh, this morning we're going to tell you all about our very exciting Wilder Bleen project. Uh, it's a pretty enormous project. Uh, we think it's very, very exciting, entirely sort of groundbreaking for the UK. Uh, and so this is going to be a little bit of a whistle stop tour through what we've achieved so far and how we've been how we've been going about it. And uh, between Vicky and I, we're going to kind of we're not got a specific order one between the other. So we're going to kind of chop and change between us as we pick up different elements of the project. So I'll crack straight in, I think, probably. I think that'll be the best way to go. So uh, just to start off with, um, I mean, we all know sort of that things can be pretty uh, bleak in the kind of situation with uh, with wildlife and declines across across the world. But I just wanted to put a bit of context on this for what the UK kind of faces. Um, and so we have these uh, reports that come out in the UK, the State of Nature reports, this one, most recent one from 2019. And uh, of course, all of the things they're telling us, which you, you would be expecting, is things are going in the wrong direction, that we have these huge amounts of species in, in decline. And what's really quite alarming about this is a lot of our really common and well-known species, things for which you know, we in the, in the UK really, really recognise and identify with, things like hedgehogs or turtle doves, are, are really in, sort of in dire straits. Um, and so the background of this is that sort of the UK um, has uh, some of the kind of least intact nature in the world we can we can use this kind of biodiversity intact index which is a bit of a, a measure in terms of how um how connected our wildlife is and how sort of uh 
uh, how much of our exist uh, sort of uh, original kind of biodiversity we might have. And if we look at this graph from out of 218 countries that were assessed in this, uh, the UK ranks at number 189. And so this is really alarming for us working in conservation here in the UK. And it just means that we need to do something different. We need to do something uh, that challenges this and that can really kind of drive uh, species return in, in the UK. We also have this slightly odd situation with the way in which we think about our wildlife conservation. Uh, and this, I wanted to bring up this statement here, which says that conservation sites must be maintained in what is called favorable condition, which means the condition in which they were found when they were originally designated. And at first glance, that seems like a, a pretty good way to go. We want to protect things and we don't want them to get any, any worse. But many of our sites were uh, were in fact designated shortly after the Second World War in the kind of 40s and 50s at a time when arguably nature was doing pretty poorly and we had very, very heavily modified landscapes anyway. And so we're trying to um, we're sort of forced into a system where we're trying to keep our uh, nature conservation sites in a in an artificial state. We're not keeping them at the best they possibly can be. We're keeping them at a state that they were in the, in the 40s and 50s. And this is really, really problematic in, for the future if we think about facing things like climate change, which are going to dramatically change these sites on their own on anyway. And so this is something uh, quite useful kind of context for how we're thinking about the Wilder Bean project and what and what that means. And so a little bit about uh, about us, who we are. So Kent Wildlife Trust are one of 46 wildlife trusts nat nationally. We all tend to be kind of county based. Uh, Kent is one of the largest uh, of these um, with about 32,000 members. I've been around since 1958. And so we really kind of specialize in managing nature reserves. We, we own or manage large bits of nature, uh, large bits of Kent, about uh, 8,000 acres, give or take. And actually this that figures out of date, it's about 84 reserves now. Uh, and sort of our primary objective is restoring the wildlife, wildlife to Kent. And so that kind of very practical site-based habitat management is, is, is our bread and butter. That's what we've been doing uh, for, for many, many decades. But this is a partnership with uh, with Wildwood Trust, and Vicky will introduce what you do. If I can get you to click as well, Sam, I can sure. get some pretty pictures. Uh, so yeah, we're Wildwood Trust, and we are a British species wildlife park set within 40 acres of ancient woodland. And our captive collection includes uh, we have brown bears, bison, elk. We've also got wolves and lynx, for example. And then we've got some species which are probably more familiar in the British countryside, like uh, foxes and badgers, for example. But Behind the scenes, there's this huge conservation effort um, and we have a number of conservation programs that we've been involved in for a number of years. Um, most notably, we've been working with water voles and hazel dormice where we provide uh, captive bred individuals for reintroductions into the country. And we've been a very popular, you know, we're very fortunate to be quite a popular uh, visitor attraction where we have about 170,000 visitors a year and a pretty comprehensive uh, membership base. And our mission is to protect, conserve and rewild uh, British wildlife. And as Sam mentioned, they have, uh, Kent Wildlife Trust has the landscape scale um, experience. And what we bring to the, the partnership is our experience of working with a, a number of different species, having the experience of working around what's classified as dangerous wild animals, as well as sort of conservation uh, breeding experience. Fantastic. Thanks, Vicky. And so, what is the Wilder Bleen project all about? Well, our overall aim is, is what we're calling the restoration of complete natural processes to a lowland English woodland. So this kind of falls into four main sections. We, we have uh, the big headline grabbing bits, which are which is the bison, but also this is part of a, a suite of other um, uh, grazing, grazing herbivores, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the project. And it's all about trying to kind of kickstart natural processes. So the, our first kind of objective was to introduce those large herbivores, some of which for the first time, uh, and kind of use those to, to naturally manage a, a woodland space. And the second thing is, that, of course, we're trying to create a more biodiverse and crucially a more resilient ecosystem. And one of the things that we'll talk about in this project is moving from a system where we have in the past just measured things like biodiversity, the number of different species we have, 
to, to, to measures of things like bioabundance of how much uh, actual overall kind of life, how much is that kind of weight of species on site. It's a, one of those ways in, in which we can determine the kind of uh, declines in terms of, uh, of uh, population size rather than just um, individual species. And so we're really trying to kickstart this more biodiverse, more resilient ecosystem and bring people along with us on the way so there is a very big sort of public engagement part of this project too a big education piece and then the final section of this is that we really want to create a model for the rest of the uk and really and what this is one of the reasons that we're members of the european rewilding network we really want to base this on international best practice the uk does some certain things in quite peculiar ways in terms of conservation and we really wanted to bring the broadest suite of kind of of experience and knowledge in to, to, to sort of shape this project uh yeah uh, so those are the kind of four main elements that we have uh, to delivering the wild Bleen. and so what does this actually look like on a, on a site well if i give you a little bit of background context on how we were managing uh, this site before this is uh, west bean and thorndon woods um uh, Kent Wildlife Trust has owned uh, and managed this site for a little over 20 years now um, and before that it was um, uh, owned for by a bank for commercial forestry so it's an ancient woodland but has been heavily modified over time and if I just draw your attention over to the right hand side of this um, we uh, just in the right hand side is where wildwood is situated so right on the boundary of this nature reserve we have we have wildwood situated to this so it's a really kind of unique uh, setup that we have with this in large nature reserve right on the on the boundary of this wildlife park and so the way that we were managing this in the in the past this is a this is a protected site uh, it's designated as a site of special scientific interest uh, it's sort of a uk designation and uh, we were always thinking about this in terms of individual blocks, so we break it up into the individual habitat types uh, and manage each one of those independently. We would think about, OK, this is a, an area of scrub and we would maintain that scrub with using machinery and a kind of coppice rotation. Uh, and we would treat all those different bits to keep those habitats as they are, more or less kind of in stasis, if you like, for the species that are there. And, you know, that's kind of fine. That's the way that we were doing things. That's the way that conservation management has been done in the UK for a long time. Um, but when you extend that thinking a little bit further to the type of species that we're thinking about there, it starts to sort of not add up quite so well. We're thinking that, well, OK, well, all those purple bits, all the areas of coppice are suitable for nightingales. And so the nightingales belong in just those blocks and we'll monitor those species in those blocks. And that's where we expect them to be. And that's and nothing, nothing will change. But of course, that is a highly artificial system and any number of pressures can start to affect one of those blocks. They may, you know, may, may have a sort of disease or pests and things like that, or, or climate change can affect this. And any one of those populations can start to, to blink out of existence. And then it's really difficult to start to get them back. And so we really wanted to move away from this system of thinking about things in isolation to managing the site as much more of a whole. The other way, and of course, in which we were doing this is, which is how conservation is traditionally done, woodland management is done in, in the UK at the moment, is to maintain those blocks and those habitats in different in different uh, stages requires a huge amount of mechanical intervention. You know, we are we are harvesting timber with big machinery, maintaining open rides by by using flails and, tra and tractors. And this is this is we're not talking commercial forestry here. We're talking, you know, sensitive uh, site, cons you know, conservation type woodland management. And it still requires this huge amount of kind of uh, wood of, of large machinery to do this. And so Vicky's going to just talk about a slightly different way of thinking about it. Thank you, Zan. So we wanted to adopt this more uh, wild approach by uh, reinstating those natural processes by using ecosystem engineers essentially and when we look back in time and i'm talking thousands of years to what was managing our woodlands we had a whole suite of individual species fulfilling different ecological niches we had elk we had the step bison we had wild ponies and we had boar we had deer we had the auroch so we had a very complex system that was managing our our landscape and over time that has degraded to just a handful of species that have been uh, fulfilling that role. And so for this project, although the European bison have almost been uh, the superstars of the project, uh, they are being joined by a suite of other grazers and browsers. And we felt it was, it was really important to, to try and tap into each of those ecological niches that fit need fulfilling. And so with that in mind, we decided that we wanted to use some pigs for the project. Um, now, ideally, we would have been using wild boar, but that was 
uh, a little bit more uh, tricky with regards to legislation and public access. And so we decided to go for an Iron Age pig, which is a domesticated variety. It's a cross between <coughs> wild boar and Tamworth pigs, which means they, they have the same um, foraging behavior as wild boar and are a pretty robust and, and hardy breed. And essentially they are, um, are natural rotivators in that they can disturb and turn up the soil, which is uh, to benefit for uh, a diverse floral range. We also decided to use the Old English Longhorn. Um, it's a really hardy breed um, and can, you know, has been used for a number of wilding projects uh, throughout the UK. We thought it was essential that we included ponies in the mix because of their selective foraging behavior. Um, they can follow the cattle into newly opened up areas and feed selectively on, on vegetation that uh, it sort of comes back quite quickly and can dominate and therefore keeping that vegetation in check, allowing again for a more uh, diverse floral range. And then that leads me on to the European bison. Aside from the conservation uh, status and conservation breeding program that I'm sure you're aware of, um, that was one reason for why we wanted to use the European bison. But the other side of the story is through their unique uh, browsing and foraging behavior. You can have the next slide, please, Dan. And so just to look at some of that uh, different behavior, because they are a bulky, big animal, they can really create corridors through quite densely uh, vegetated habitat. Um, and in doing so, this allows access to other wildlife to reach areas that they wouldn't necessarily have had access to before. Their dung is a really important, um, not only a really important habitat for a, a number of species, but also provides nutrients back into the soil. Um, their feeding behavior is very unique in that looking at studies in Europe, which suggests that uh, they target the more woodier parts of the tree and the plant, um, which domesticated cattle can't do or won't do. And so this means that they end up ring barking uh, certain species of tree, which creates standing deadwood, again, a really valuable habitat type for a number of invertebrates, birds and mammals, for example. And then over time, the standing deadwood would fall and create woodland glades, so openings in the landscape, which allows for that region, that really important um, vegetation regeneration, which can support an increase in biodiversity. They also dust bays as well, which create these flattened areas throughout the landscape, which provides uh, vital basking areas for reptiles and invertebrates, uh, for example. And again, looking at Europe, um, we've been aware of, of projects that have noticed that uh, songbirds have been using some of the fur, bison fur, to insulate their nest. And now they're, they're doing uh, projects to, to understand if that increases um, productivity from the breeding birds. Next slide, please. Fantastic. Thanks, Vicky. And so we're just it's all about trying to create these more dynamic ecosystems. We have uh, the Iron Age pigs, as we as as Vicky mentioned, um, which are our kind of uh, ecological replacement for for wild boar, um, which are just too complex to have uh, to have public in the same space as in under UK legislation, uh, if you own the animals. Um, but what we really want to, to create are these kind of large kind of turned over turned over areas this is a this is a photograph from from nep in west sussex where they've created they've really kind of turned over the soil created that through their sort of rooting action and this is absolutely fantastic for allowing plants to germinate and also absolutely fantastic for things like turtle doves these are the sort of species that we would love to see back uh, into into our woodlands and into, into our kind of more open areas of of, of the site um, but of course alongside all of this goes uh, how we involve people. Uh, sorry, Vicky. <laughs> That's all right. And so as Dan mentioned, we've been really, really active with our community engagement. It's been absolutely essential um, that we've we've spoken to all of the neighbours, all of the people that are using the nature reserve, um, interested uh, businesses, you know, absolutely everyone we've we've tried to engage with so that we could really hear their their thoughts and um, understand their feelings towards the project. But aside from all of the community engagement, there's also the opportunity to provide a wild space for people to reconnect to nature. Um, and this is something that 
is missing. People, people sort of, it's almost a shift in baseline uh, syndrome in that people um, aren't aware of what has been here historically and what can be here. And so it provides the opportunity for them to vis visit the reserve and see this wilding approach. And we're also uh, developing um, ecotourism offers as well and, and looking at how potentially um, income can be generated on, through the project as well to keep um, the funding for the future. Fantastic. And I'm sure, as all of you are very aware, this project has uh, really captured the imagination of, of many, many thousands or even billions of people. Uh, some of these stats here are actually slightly out, slightly out of date now. We have we have huge number of pieces of news coverage that have that have reached many, many, many people around the world, uh, featuring on uh, programs, UK programs like Country File, but also news stories, news articles, all, in all different news stations all around all around the world, um, and. One of the things we sort of expected some of this when we talked about uh, the the bison. What we didn't really realise was how you know many different elements of the project would really capture people's imagination. And if you look on top of the left there, when we when we hired our our first two bison rangers, uh, Tom and Don, uh, that really really just went uh, phenomenally huge across the whole world again. And we in, ended up having roughly one thousand two hundred applicants for two jobs. Uh, so that was a huge lengthy process uh, to, to whittle those people down to just the final two that we got. But uh, yeah, Tom and Don are our absolutely fantastic, hugely qualified bison rangers. And uh, well, that's that's how you get the absolute best people, isn't it? If you've got that much competition going on, I suppose. Um, and so what does the project now actually look like? This is this is a, a new map of the same site. You can see Wildwood Trust over there on, on, on the right hand side. Um, and we're sort of starting to manage this in a effectively a much simpler way. Uh, rather than thinking about this in terms of lots and lots of different individual units all being managed separately, we're just managing it uh, effectively in, in three ways, in three ways. And uh, this is really due to the fact that this is the first time we've done this. There are some practical considerations on how we've had to set the project up, but we really wanted to be kind of really data driven in the way that we that we do this. And so we have three different uh, treatment types, if you like. We have the bison, which will also be joined by the Exmoor ponies uh, and Iron Age pigs uh, in, in one set of compartments. And those are the light green shaded compartments. There are kind of five uh, shown on here there, but they are the intentions for them to all be linked. And so all of those uh, compartments are, are one. They're all one uh, with free access, no, no control over access uh, for the animals in and out of those compartments so they can freely move between them. So we have one treatment, bison, ponies and pigs. And then to compare against that, uh, in the in the other areas of the site, everything uh, sort of on the right hand side of, of what's marked as Thorndon Wood Road up there, everything else that's a slightly darker green colour um, has our, what we're calling our kind of domestic assemblage or our, our proxy assemblage, which are uh, is everything else is the same. We still have ponies, we still have uh, Iron Age pigs, but instead of the bison, we're using those those Sussex Longhorns. And so uh, by doing that, we can compare the effects of what the bison bring to that assemblage against what a, what a domesticated cow uh, can do in, in their stead. But we also have a third treatment type, which is everything over on the most left hand edge of this of this uh, site, everything to the to the left of uh, sort of this Thorndon Wood Road. Um, and that is our control area. And when I say control area, that doesn't mean we don't do anything at all. That is a control in terms of we continue to do the wooden management in the way that it's been done for the last 20 years with coppice management using mechanical interventions. And so we continue to do that that management in those sites. And so there we can compare, you know, overall what the effects of having having, you know, large grazers and, and browsers in, in, in the woodland are uh, into an area compared to an area that, does, that doesn't have that, uh, that input. And so it should be a really, really interesting kind of uh, experiment to see what, what comes out from this. And of course, this uh, is a sort of fantastic for, for people as well. We've got lots of different uh, walking routes that go around the woodland. We've got, you know, these these different crossing points, which give people a chance to view animals. I'll talk a little bit more about what they look like a little bit later. And we've got uh, new walking trails and uh, we've encouraged sort of cycling routes through the woodland as well. And so it's a really kind of rich uh, and unique experience of people to, 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 to view the woodland and uh, 
yeah experience what the animals will be like in their in their presence and so to say that the the bison themselves are behind fences people can't have free public access into those areas but everything else where where the where the cattle the ponies and the pigs are they can they can walk freely through those areas so they could bump into a cow but you won't bump into a bison at the moment So thank you, Stan. So yeah, this, this breaks it down into probably more, more simpler terms in that we've got these two different grazing assemblages and then we have this no grazing or control compartment. And just to give you an idea of scale, so the bison assemblage is going to be uh, grazing and browsing within about a 208 hectare compartment. Uh, the domesticated assemblage or the proxy assemblage is going to be a slightly bigger area, uh, about 244 hectares. And then uh, the control or the, the no grazing um, area is about 117 hectares. And we felt it was really important that we could um, evidence why we want to use European bison. Um, you know, there is this domesticated alternative. We could use uh, domesticated breeds like the longhorn, for example. Um, but we know that they, the bison can, can interact differently and forage differently than the domesticated um, breeds. Um, so we really wanted to put together an air ex experimental uh, project so that we could collect the evidence and data to really support that statement. Next slide, please. And so how we've done this is is we have this really extensive and comprehensive monitoring program, which um, has been produced for this for this whole project, and it's been divided into into four different sections. So the first section or the first monitoring area is we we want to look at the habitat structure and the vegetation dynamics of the site. And the question that we are asking is what is happening to the structures and plant communities on site. So to determine this, we wanted to ensure that we're doing baseline surveys. And this is a common theme throughout the whole um, monitoring uh, strategies is that we've collected data before the grazers and the animals have arrived on site so that we get a really good understanding of what the landscape looks like before animals and then what it looks like with them there and how it changes. And so with, the, with regard to the habitat structure and vegetation dynamics, um, this involves using a drone. And we have uh, a, a drone that carries out uh, fixed transects so that we can get some aerial photography of what the canopy looks like from above. And what that allows us to look at is whether the canopy changes if areas start to get opened up by having, uh, for example, the bison um, on site. And Stan, did you just want to talk about this graphic here? Uh, yeah, so the, thanks, Vicky. The central point I just want to draw your attention to here, we have these 142 fixed monitoring locations on site as well. So in addition to the drone surveys, we're visiting these, these sites uh, every year, 142 sites. And the, the run through that was just shown there is how we're now doing this all via an app. So through kind of, we're try, really trying to embrace as much technology as possible to make this as simple and accessible as possible for, for folks in the future. And so the first year we did this, it was all pen and paper, and then was about you know three months of kind of re-adding all of those uh, that data into the computer system. But we now have this app that we developed uh, in-house um, using something called Mergin. And this, uh, this allows us to record that data in the field uh, directly into the database. So there's no write-up afterwards. So it, uh, it just speeds up the whole process quite, quite considerably. And so the second element of what we wanted to, uh, to study and understand is uh, individual, like the biodiversity and bioabundance of the site. And the question that we ask is how rich is the amount of life on site? both in numbers of species, but also, as Dan mentioned earlier, the size of the populations and the amount of, of individuals that are on site. And so this has been um, it, it looked at by doing individual taxa surveys, so individual species uh, surveys, looking at uh, invertebrates, the plant community, also looking at birds and small mammals, and in particular with small mammals, is looking at the dormouse population um, and how that changes over time. We also wanted to ensure that we are capturing these flagship species as well. And, and the site is a hotspot uh, or, or one of the best population um, for heath fritillary uh, butterflies. And, and we, we wanted to ensure that we are capturing um, data about the population and that we are repeating that so that we can really track the changes to the population. And the, the vision is that the heath fritillary numbers will increase 
because the food plant um, cow wheat really uh, needs these sort of opened up areas which we feel that the bison uh, will contribute to. So we, we hope that it will have a, a positive impact on, on this particular butterfly species. We also, you know, we're not sure at the moment what might turn up. And so we want to ensure that we are capturing um, information on the species as they arrive. And if there's particular other flagship species that, that may turn up, that we can then uh, track those trends to the population as well. And another element that we want to look at is that trophic complexity. And this will be investigated by looking at the individual taxa surveys and how uh, that complexity changes um, over the course of the, of the project. Next slide, please, Ben. And just to go into a little bit more detail with regard to the invertebrate surveys and how that looks, uh, we've installed 15 flight intercept traps. And so that is five per treatment area. And we collect samples once a month through the um, through the months of May to September because that's when the invertebrates are most active. And we have an, an army of volunteers essentially, which are now going through, working their way through all of the samples so that we can start to understand and, and establish what the invertebrate abundance is for the site. Next slide, please. And so the third element that we'd like to look at is that natural processes. As we've mentioned before, we are using ecosystem engineers um, or keystone species to, to reinstate those natural processes. And so we're going to be carrying out sort of baseline grazing, and browsing pressure surveys. Um, the site doesn't have um, a population of deer at the moment, but that's not to say they may not turn up in, in the future. So we just want to make sure that we are we have a, a, a survey in place that will capture that information. Um, we also want to look at how the grazers are moving through the landscape. And so representatives of each of the species will be collared um, and this will provide us really useful information on where they're resting, where they're foraging, how they're using that enclosed space. We also want to look at the behavior of the herds as well and how they're interacting between each other and how they are reacting within the same uh, same species as well. Um, so this would be looking at sort of behavioral uh, studies. We want to map the reduction in human influence. So looking at sort of staff time and how that staff, um, how staff have managed the landscape. As, as Dan said previously, um, it was a huge amount of human effort to to manage the woodland um, with big machinery, for example, as well. So we really want to sort of track the decline in those staff hours with a biodiversity uplift, which again, we can draw that information from those individual taxa uh, surveys. And then we want to look at the amount of sort of dead wood, for example, that is uh, being created over the site. So, and looking at the fungi community so that we can really get an understanding of, again, how the bison are having that positive impact. Next slide, please. And this is just an example of some of the collar data that we've already uh, started to receive. So the bison at the moment are within what we call a soft release area, which is a smaller area within the bison compartment. And this was a good, good opportunity to allow the herd to meet and for them to settle and to become familiar with the, the new habitat, the new landscape that they've been moved into. Um, and next, uh, next click, please, Dan. This is an example of the collars that we are using. So we're using a system called Smart Parks. Um, we looked at a number of different um, options with regards to collars for the animals um, and smart parks came out as the best fit. So sort of more traditional GPS collars don't work. Unfortunately, they're not, they're not very, um, very effective in a closed canopy um, setting. And, and it was a little bit um, tricky to make sure that they had signal all the time. So we decided to go for this smart park um, setup, which meant that we had to put in um, what we call base stations. So three separate base stations, which um, pumps out a long range Wi-Fi, essentially, which is what the colors communicate to. Um, and I believe, I think I'm right in saying that this was the first time um, that this setup had been used in the UK. So we we're really excited that this project um, had the opportunity to use these colors. Next slide, please, Dan. And so the last of the four areas that we're focusing on is ecosystem services and natural capital. And the question that we're asking is, is this functioning system providing us with the things we need? And to do this, we wanted to look at um, uh, 
carbon element within within the project. So we are familiar with the theory that a more complex and biodiverse vegetation um, system can sequester more carbon. And so we're taking soil samples for carbon analysis to hopefully prove, prove this point. We've also got uh, students looking at doing eDNA um, sampling in the soil so that we can get a really idea of how diverse um, the uh, the soil or how healthy the soil is with regards to what's living within it as well as looking at fungi communities as well and then it's important to note about the pollen pollinators as well you know they are a, a real they're really valuable for us as, as humans and so capturing uh, pollinator data through those individual uh, invertebrate surveys has, is really important next slide please and so just to, again, just to give an example, so 142 soil samples have been analysed for carbon in November. And we've also partnered up with Canterbury Christchurch University, who is doing that eDNA work with the soil, looking at fungi and bacteria. And I just want to add that we've been very fortunate in that we have a number of academic partners um, which have been really interested in the project and, and reached out once it was announced. And so um, the various areas within the monitoring programme um, have been sort of allocated to different academic um, institutes for uh, student projects. And, and it's been amazing how much of a, a long-term commitment they want to invest in this project. Next slide, please. And so just, just to pull out some of those key baseline uh, survey findings. So this is the baseline surveys before the animals arrived on site. And we had an astonishing 826 invertebrate species be identified. Um, unfortunately, 67 of those species have a conservation status. We had a huge number of spiders turn up, 178 different species. And most notably is the critically rare Pistus truncatus, uh, which is the first UK record in 20 years. Um, and we had another genus of, of dwarf spider, which hasn't been seen in the UK since 2004. So, it was it was remarkable that we had this this number of species on site, um, but also just to note there hasn't been this level of of scrutiny almost of of the site, and this is you know a real fortunate part of of the project is that we could you know we could invest and we could do this this level of surveys to really understand what's here at the moment. Next slide, please. and then again just looking at the bird um, bird record, so we had thirty four. Uh, breeding birds on site, and this included lesser red poles, spotted flycatcher, nightingales, and lesser spotted woodpecker, for example. So, this is this is fantastic stuff that we we are finding out and learning about the site. And it's hope you know the hope is that each of these surveys will be repeated each year, and we can really start to see the trends and how adopting this wilding approach and moving away from a, a human managed landscape can be of benefit to biodiversity and make sure that we are recording all of that information. Fab, thanks, thanks Vicky. It's a huge monitoring program, tons and tons of effort goes into this. And so that's really is a whistle stop tour of all of the different activities that are going and going on through that. Um, I just wanted to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but just wanted to talk a few, a little bit about some of the peculiarities around the sort of legal and compliance considerations for the project, things that we had to navigate and, uh, and uh, for the, for the, for the, to make this project happen on this kind of scale. Um, we have some specific acts which are used, uh, specific to the UK, so we have something called the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, which lists certain species, including bison and wild boar. Um, which which governs how um, those species can be kept and uh, in a nutshell it says you can't have the public in the same space as those species it, there's a lot of other criteria around it as well but of course that meant that we had to fence out the bison areas for the time being that we couldn't have public access into those areas uh, at least initially so whilst we don't think that is necessarily the best way forward or the you know what needs to happen in the long term we, we you know we can we have seen from other examples uh, uh, on the continent that um People and bison can exist in the same spaces, you know, quite happily if that's managed properly. Um, but that's a that's a, a battle for us to fight further on further on down the line. We wanted to get the animals here doing their job so that we could show the you know make the case for them to be here. Um, other things that we had to think about things like uh, uh, 
triple SI consent. So this, you know, this is a, a site of special scientific interest. It had previously been monitored in these individual different units. And we're now trying to manage this as a whole. That is quite problematic because you can have species moving from one place to another, uh, and that wouldn't have been captured in the original kind of system. And so you, we had to work very closely with uh, Natural England, the government body who, who, uh, who, who are responsible for these licenses uh, to how we can uh, monitor condition in, in, a, in a wilding kind of situation across different triple SI units. And so we're in a kind of a unique situation on that front too. Uh, and of course, some of these bits of infrastructure require planning permission. You know, these are these you know counters counter development, even though we're doing them for a conservation purpose. And so, we, it's a lot of kind of different things that we are having to navigate to make this project happen. And you can see the sort of scale of fencing that we've had to install um, to comply with the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, keeping those bison and people separate. Um, it's quite different from other situations where where bison have uh, exist in different places at the moment. And one particular element of this I just wanted to, to highlight, uh, and this covers a, a number of these things, so including uh, planning permission and also public rights of way. So we have about 16 kilometers of, of designated public footpaths. These are, these are enshrined in law that say they must not change and they've been there for a very, very long time and provide public access across the woodland. And so those footpaths, are, um, we didn't want to change them. We didn't want them to move. We wanted to allow public access across them. But that gives you a problem if you can't have bison in the same space as people and the site is crisscrossed by these public footpaths, which can never be closed. How do you get bison from one side to another of a, of a footpath? Uh, and so we went round and round on this quite a few different times and what we ended up with with the idea of creating bison tunnels we we took some of the idea from this from a project in america with american bison in, in near illinois called the natusa grasslands project who have tunnels in place for bison uh, and effectively this is what we've uh, ended up with uh, um, these are these are our designs that are currently going through some of those permission stages at the moment and the idea is that each in each of these kind of locations, we have four of these across site to link compartments, mean that we can, um, the footpath gets uh, get raised up and over a, a tunnel. The tunnels are all above ground, so the bison walk on level ground from one place to another, and the public effectively have an elevated viewing platform and a gentle gradient that means they can walk over and above and, and down the other side. So it means that bison can and the other animals can have free access uh, Beneath, we don't have to open and close gates or anything like that. Uh, they can choose where they go, but the people can still move freely across the site. And so, we're really, really excited to see how these how these work out for the for the long term. And I think people will get a really exciting experience, sort of being able to see out into the, into the woodland from this elevated position. And so, just to start to sort of wrap up on some of this, then um, this is just a bit of a timeline to show how quickly this project has moved forward. We really only started just uh, as kind of COVID hit. In fact, the first UK lockdown was announced the same day as we got the funding for for this project from the from the People's Postcode Lottery Dream Fund, um, and uh, and so it's been a really sort of strange couple of years to make this all happen quite rapidly under kind of slightly uh, tricky circumstances. And we and you can see from this timeline that we've effectively had um, kind of you know three different work streams going on at the same time. The monitoring kicked off right at the start. Get those baseline monitoring done. Um, make sure that we have those surveys right from from day one as, as early as we possibly could and continuing and of course the public engagement had to start really early on with school visits um, thinking about uh, doing safaris and tours on site a lot of this quite difficult during covid times um, and of course all the infrastructure going in at the same time so those kind of three different elements the monitoring and the the, the public engagement and all of the infrastructure all happening uh, in, in in parallel to each other to get us to where we are now and so Pleasingly, we can say that the bison were the first bison were released onto site um, ooh, about two months ago now, something like that. I think yeah, two months ago now, um, and the rest of the livestock will be joining them just later on this year. So we're really excited. Just finishing off some of the other fencing, and then we'll have that full suite of species just at the end of this year. We should be able to get to uh, to a point where we have that kind of full range and the project will be completely up and running but of course to say this is only the beginning this is just the setup phase of this project this project is going to run and run and uh, and we just uh, yeah really really excited to see what happens for the for the longer term on this i think so i'm a pre appreciate that we are running tight on time but we do we did we did think it'd be quite nice to just show you a couple of videos so because the powerpoint had a little bit of difficulty struggling with with the videos um we're just bringing them up separately so this um i'm not sure how clear this is coming through but this is just to show you an example of of one of the tracks that the bison have already created 
um, throughout the bleen. And this was in, you know, a matter of a week, something like that. It was, it didn't take long at all for them to start um, making these, these corridors through quite dense vegetation. It's quite a dense uh, silver birch thicket that they're, they're sort of moving through. And then again, we just wanted to show you some of their behavior with their, with regards to the debarking. So this is uh, this is one of the one of our females just um, stripping off off the bark on some of the some of the birch and, and sweet chestnut, um, and they they make it look easy. They literally eat it like spaghetti. It's it's no trouble at all for them. And what we're finding is that they are targeting certain species to to debark, and then there's other species that they'll just nibble the branches and the leaves. Um, so it's it's not the same amount of pressure on on each of the different uh, trees. I'll just skip on to the next slide, I think. If yep. that's right. okay. um, and then again, they've already started to uh, sort of rub up against some of the pine. Um, if you just want to click through these. Yeah. So within a matter of, you know, a few days, they've already started to to, to wear off that top layer. Again, uh, this is uh, a willow that they've started to uh, to debark. And again, it was the speed at which they started to have uh, this impact. And they've been uh, sort of thrashing around in some of the bracken and, and opening up spaces, um, creating these dust baths already. And, and what has literally been remarkable is just the speed at which they started doing it. It was almost like they had a tick box of all the different things we knew that they could do. And they were like, right, we've got to get it all done. And they went out and, and did it, um, you know, fairly, fairly straight away into the landscape. Fantastic. So just to finish off, to say that this is what we're really trying to do. This is a kind of vision of what we want for the future that people can really start to enjoy and uh, you know be excited by a landscape rich, thriving in wildlife um, that, that that all kind of works together. And it doesn't stop here. It doesn't just stop with this one site that we're talking about, although it's a large site. Um, it's part of a much wider woodland complex. And this is this is a sort of a, just a concept of, of what it looks like. Up on the right hand uh, end there and you can see the red star which is where wildwood are located and where the wilder bean project is happening across that dark green area but this whole landscape is 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 what quite fortunately only owned by a kind of small number of, of conservation ngos and we we've just recently formed a partnership between ourselves the rspb and the woodland trust to, to try to manage this wood to this woodland landscape which is more than 11 square miles to uh, to to as a, as a kind of functional whole so we're really trying to see how grazing animals and large herbivores can can make an impact across across a much much larger area can we have a you know a truly nature driven kind of natural park in the southeast of england that's our vision for the future and it uh, hopefully everyone can come along with us on this journey thank you very much thank you perfect Thank you so much, both of you. That was an amazing presentation. I think we can all agree that this project is very thoroughly developed. Um, it's really nice to see a project where you are looking at rewilding from many angles. You are um, exploring the ecosystem services that it provides and also the biodiversity effects. You're creating experiments to also kind of, you mentioned Stan about following international best practices, but I think you guys are also developing uh, best practices in your work. Uh, so it's super interesting and we got a ton of questions. Um, so we will not have time for all of the questions. So everyone, if you want to, please feel free to upvote any questions that you want answered. Um, and I will do my best to, we will do our best to answer the main ones. Um, so when it comes to, let's answer a few when it comes to the reintroduction the reintroductions themselves. Um, there is one here from Hera uh, who asks, how does it work with the pigs, ponies, and cattle? Are they considered farm animals? Can they breed freely? Are they vaccinated, for example? How is that dealt with? That's a really good question. Um, yes, in, in, in effectively, in terms of the UK legislation, they are treated as, as farm animals. Uh, effectively, that's the, that's the rules under which we have to work. So they are vaccinated uh, against things. But in terms of medical treatments, we, and one of the reasons we, we didn't show you this, but we have built a kind of quite elaborate corral system just on the edge of the project so that we can, if we do have to treat any individual animals and in, intervene for welfare reasons, then that happens off site. It ha doesn't, so that those medicines don't, don't get into the rest of the wider environment. But yes, we're still beholden to all of the kind of normal livestock legislation uh, around, around those animals. 
we don't currently have them breeding at the moment that could change in the future that's because we wanted the bison to be able to breed themselves on site um, and so when we were setting this project up we wanted to be absolutely certain that there was plenty of space for the bison that their herd could grow naturally and so it was more of a buffer to be able to keep the other animals not breeding at the beginning so that we so that the populations aren't all expanding all at the same time but we'll keep that under review and so long as the bison are happy and healthy and the woodlands responding well we may we may look to change that in the future perfect um also, there's been a question by Stephanie. Um, she's asking, have there been any negative reactions by people to the bison? And if so, how are they addressed? So I'm happy to take that one, Sam. Um, so we were slightly overwhelmed through that sort of initial community engagement and that, you know, reaching out and speaking to all the parish councils, all the different, you know, interest groups and things like that, that on a whole, they were largely really positive about the project. And I think, you know, they, they did sort of how it's kind of been delivered in, in that the time is now, we need to do something different now. You know, what's been happening before has served a purpose for that time, but now, you know, in the midst of a climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, we need to think bigger. And this is this is how we're going to respond to it. Um, there, I suppose any sort of the negativity, any negativity that was sort of received was was more when all of the infrastructure started to go in into place and as Dan says you know we have had our hands tied slightly by um you know there's this piece of legislation the DWA the Dangerous Wild Animals Act which we have to adhere to because that's what bison are categorized as um and that meant that we've had to put in this two fencing system so when that work started taking place um I think it's like any project when you start to see work happening it becomes a bit more real for people um but you know we we were just any any concerns that were raised we we've all all of the project team have been re working really hard to make sure that we could go and listen to their concerns and just hopefully talk them through the process and say look this is a short term part of it the long term effect is going you know is going to be so much more bene beneficial um and try to get them focused on the future as opposed to the sort of the short term um work in the beginning. Mm. That's a great point. Um, kind of related to this, but more moving into the experimental um, development that you guys have in Wilderbrain have developed, which I thought was incredibly interesting. I can't wait to uh, find out all the results eventually. Iñaki is asking, uh, what effects are expected in each treatment uh, from your perspectives in your personal experience, the control the bison and no bison? I think that's really interesting. I, I sort of want to, uh, one point I want to say on this, which is quite challenging, I think, for conservation practitioners is that this is an experiment. Um, and as nature reserve managers, the idea is we want to make the whole nature reserve as good as it possibly can be as quickly as we possibly can. And so the idea that some areas of this may not do as well as other areas because we've set it up as a, as a controlled experiment is really difficult for site managers. It's difficult legislatively as well. It's difficult for kind of saying, some bits of this nature reserve might not do as well but those bits that aren't going to do as well are only being treated in the way that they have been treated up until now for the last 20 years so we're not going backwards <laughs> if you like and so um i well from what we've seen in the very early days of what the bison have been doing already i i i just can't imagine that any of the other areas are going to be quite as exciting as as that we've seen fantastic new fungi growing out of dung already we've seen these new structures in the wood and we've never seen before uh, of kind of all of the side branches being knocked off and forming this kind of three foot deep matrix of branches just which all the spiders are using and it just it's we've never seen these structures before in the woodland I just it's so much more complicated than it was before um I don't know what's going to turn up but I'm really excited about it <laughs> yes yes um I think we should have another webinar when we have more information mm. That's a, we're already organizing something new. Um, <laughs> there's also an interesting question um, about, so Edwina, is, she's watching from Germany and they have wild boar roaming the forest around Berlin where she lives. And she's asking, what is the barrier to having wild boar in the UK? Is it principally legal and public attitude or is, it, is there something different about the UK environment which is preventing their reintroduction? And are there plans to lobby for that reintroduction like there has been with the beaver and lynx? 
really good. Do you want to take bits, Vicky? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, I suppose it, it boils down to legislation, essentially. So um, wild boar are categorised as dangerous wild animals, as well as obviously European bison. And it, the, the purpose of the project was obviously trying to champion the use of European bison. That's why we could then, um, you know, put in all of the infrastructure that's needed. But because we wanted to create that grazing mix with different uh, different species, so pigs and uh, horses, to make it comparable, we needed pigs and horses to go alongside uh, the domesticated cattle, which is in then public areas. So we couldn't, you know, we couldn't um, put the level of fence in and exclude public from the areas that the domesticated or proxy assemblage is going to be uh, roaming. So I think um, it was a, a legislative barrier which prevented the use of wild boar, and that's why we decided to go for um, this hybrid version, which is which is the Iron Age pig. Dan, did you want to follow on? Yeah, just to, just to add to that, it, you, the the wild boar is one of the most is the weirdest animal on that Dangerous Wild Animals Act because they uh, because wild boar are freely roaming in many parts of the UK, and so it comes down to uh, a question of ownership. If you own the animals, you are legally responsible for them, and then therefore you 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 the the, the onus of that Dangerous Wild Animals Act falls on falls on you. Um, but if you if they are wild and nobody owns them, which is a, you know how a wild animal should be, um, then then that problem falls away. But the problem is because we are putting those animals in the environment, there is no legal mechanism for us to be able to say that they're not ours um so so we we have to uh, abide by the dangerous wild animals act for that and so that is a legislative problem um it's something that lots of us are talking about and we would love to see that changed because we need to move to a system where animals can be in the landscape not under anybody's ownership and how we can coexist with those yes well actually there's a couple of questions that are related to legality so let's finish with that since it ties in so well with this. Uh, firstly, I wanted to tell everyone, I have just put in the chat some links um, about Wilder Bleen. Uh, so the Wilder Bleen website and also um, where you can donate if you wish to, and also the contact for Wilder Bleen and also the links and contact for the ERM. So you can go to the chat for that. So regarding the legal side of things edwina is asking who helps you with all these legal questions <laughs> do you have an in-house lawyer or something like that <laughs> and also liam is asking what permissions are required for the bison tunnels is that challenging uh yeah on two fronts no we don't have an in-house legal team i would love to if anyone wants to volunteer to be a lawyer for us that would be great um we've been really kind of just dividing this down by by different people's specialities you know a lot of the kind of animal movement uh, sort of legalities of this thing the wildwood folks have been really great kind of leading on a lot of those uh, not been a clear route on on those kind of things we do have um, a team in house that deal with kind of um, planning and development issues and they've been really helpful for us to kind of navigate some of that system the tunnels themselves fall under the completely standard um, development rules for building anything and so you have to go through both planning permission and also uh, we are technically diverting public rights of way even though the routes aren't changing it's because they go uphill uh, and downhill slightly now that's a, that's a diversion and so we fall under two different bits there so this is building something within a site of special scientific interest and so we had to set the bar really really high in terms of, of, of making sure that the ecology was was entirely um, in, uh, incorporated into this because what we don't want to do is set a precedent that you can do development within a triple SI. We're trying to do this for a conservation aim. We're trying to do this to make the site better, but it is treated legally in the same way as if you were trying to build a house in, in, in the middle of the woodland. And so we had to be really, really careful about the designs to keep that footprint as small as possible, that we're doing everything above and beyond we possibly can to mitigate any potential negative effects from the, from the building works themselves. That's, that's a lot of work, but I'm so glad you are all doing it. It is clearly working and it's a really interesting project. Thank you so much, Stan and Vicky, for talking to all of us uh, about the Wilder Bleem project. It's been amazing. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I hope um, you visit the links. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact uh, the link, um, the contact that's there for Wilder Bleem or myself. Um, we couldn't answer all of the questions. so please do contact us if you want to delve further into some of them. Thank you so much for today and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you.